H.L. Mencken coined a word I like, the biblio bibuli. These are people who are drunk on books. Now, I am a somewhat manic collector of books, and I read a lot of books, and I have read even more. But I'm not drunk on them as such, but if you want to accuse me of being a bookaholic or something, that would be just fine. But today's episode of the Locofoco Netcast, Let's Strike the Match, is about books. It's about the books that I own, and about the books I like, and about the books that my friend James Littleton Gill likes. So we're going to be talking about books. It'll be a wide-ranging conversation. This will not just be for libertarians this time, though libertarians will especially be amused, perhaps, and maybe even learn something. Eh, we'll see. So, number 17, Locofogo Netcast. Here we go. Right now, people are talking a lot about identity, and what they mean by identity is commonality. <laughs> that, uh, this is my theory about the whole thing, is that people are misidentifying identity. Mm -hmm. They say, my identity is I'm a black or I'm a white or something. That's not your identity. That's your commonality with the. Well, that's people. not what sets you apart. That's the strangest thing. I've, that's never made sense to me. To, to, to list as your identity the thing that, that's similar to other people. Does yeah. that make any sense? It doesn't make, make much sense. And I have to say that if your identity is your race, something you can do nothing about and which other people define for you. <laughs> It seems to be very peculiar. Now, it seems like self-definition would be a much more interesting thing to do, right? And how do you define yourself? Well, you define yourself by your interests, for one thing, as well as your, you know, your, you know, I'm me. I'm the person who's points in this direction where my ego is, whatever the ego is. And, uh, and our interests often define ourselves. And those are things we choose, to some degree anyway. And, uh, and what you do with it, of course also defines yourself. Now, everybody defines each other, and that's inevitable. And so there's a social element as well, and I don't deny that. In fact, when I was looking at my books, since I'm obviously a book fiend, in a sense, that's one of the things that I could define myself by. And that's probably how others define me, because that's one of my biggest interests. Not my only interest, but one of my biggest interests. Since I'm getting so many books in the mail, and I'm just looking through them all the time, and I'm reading about five at once, or ten at once, or and complete about tw two a week is all I'm really doing right now. But anyway, so I went on library thing. My library, my library, my personal library is on library thing. And that is a database program for people who, for people's libraries. And, uh, and then you look at each book you get, I entered each book when I, when I get it and I put it in. And one of the pieces of information they give me from library thing is how many other people have the book. And that's actually very interesting to see what your interest, how they jibe with others. And uh, mine often don't. And I uh, have a number of unique books. And I looked at my unique book list recently. And it's, I think it's about 250 unique books. I believe it's about that. Uh -huh. And uh, So you're not going to tell me your identity is a TV guide reader? No, no, no. No, uh, no not, not, not like uh, Mr. Costanza. Uh, and uh, and my identity isn't these books either. It's just that my identity could probably be gleaned better by the books that I have that no one else has. That would be the thing that would set me apart, is that what books do you have that others don't have? That's one way of doing it. Another way to do it is, what books do I have that everybody else has? That's, I mean, there's a number of ways of looking at it. Those help identify you in some odd way. And that makes more sense than race to me. I don't know why anyone would want to identify by their race. It just makes no sense. So instead of white male, you'd better be identified as a Cabellian. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. And well, uh, the water fountains would say things like Cabalians only. <laughs> and, uh, well, that okay. would be a really, that would be a really posh and uh, very rarely used uh, fountain. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the fountainhead is James Branch Cabell. The first one on my list is The Comic Spirit in George Meredith, An Interpretation. And that's an interest. it's actually an interesting book because it discusses how a 19th century author who was once really popular, well, not really popular, but fairly popular and well-regarded, uh, what he was up to. And he was a comedian. That is, he wrote comedies, but he wrote pretty sophisticated comedies. And this book uh, discussed that pretty well. Did you say Meredith? Yeah, George Meredith. Meredith uh, he's, wrote the ego, he wrote The Egoist, right? Exactly. And The, the Ordeal of Richard Feverell, 
and the shaving of Shag Pat. And uh, <laughs> oh, that's that is an amazing book. Uh, it's it's uh, quite quite a quite a romp uh, because it's just full of wordplay and and just it's it's one of those word hordes that come at you and it's it's aping uh, what we think of as or, it's an Orientalist book in the sense that it it apes a sort of an Arabic style uh, where where everybody's uh, going overboard with their imprecations and their praise and uh, poetry quotations and it, Meredith is just it's just a hoot uh, anyway and, and he's Was that uh, late late nineteenth century yeah he, eighteen seventy through nineteen hundred or something like that he wrote a famous set of poems that is actually still well known. I think it's called Modern Love. I was never really all that moved. He wrote a poem called The Lark Ascending, which Rayfon Williams uh, sort of honored with a very famous violin and orchestra piece. Lovely beyond words. And um, anyway, so there's a, I'm sort of interested in George Meredith in part because I'm interested in the difference between the comic and the tragic spirit of life. And uh, and as we all know, the difference between comedy and tragedy is uh, what is it? Time? <laughs> Distance and time? <laughs> Something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the, a book that interested me uh, from 35 years ago was uh, Thomas Sowell's A Conflict of Visions, in which he tried to distinguish between two broad visions of humanity and human nature. And one of them was the unconstrained vision and one was the constrained vision. The unconstrained vision of human nature seems to think that you can remake people. If you just set up the institutions right, everybody's going to be happy and everybody's going to be flowering. And then there's the constrained vision of human nature, which sees human beings as harder to change themselves, and thus, why would you change them? I mean, if you're you, you don't really want to be changed helter-skelter or willy-nilly, whichever you prefer, I guess. Most of my heroes in social theory are of the constrained vision, which is interesting because, of course, I'm a libertarian. So that means that my my support of liberty isn't the same as the support of liberty that somebody who has an unconstrained vision might be looking for. And they want to basically unconstrain humanity from the constraints of nature. And, I, you know, we, we have to deal with nature. We don't have to unconstrain ourselves from it. Anyway, uh, next on my list is The Climate of Europe, Past, Present, and Future. And I bought this book because we're in the middle of this huge fracas over, you know, man-made global warming. And dealing with the actual facts and the facts on the ground of climate over the last thousand years or so, that's important. But I haven't read the book yet, so I can't really talk about it very well. And then there's books like The Idea of Justice and the Problem of Argument. This is some. I almost want to share this with Stephen Kinsella and argue with him about it, but, but um, he's not here, so we'll uh, just pass on. I have a book about the Stute de Tracy and the French liberalism. And that's, uh, the Trossi is another one of my kind of heroes. His errors are probably as important to me as his successes. The Trossi is connected to Jefferson, isn't it? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson translated the Trossi's uh, book that would be called The Will and Its Effects if it were translated directly into English, but Thomas Jefferson translated it as a treatise on political economy. So it's, it's a very interesting book. I really enjoyed it. Next on my list of weirdos is uh, The Outcome of Individualism by J.H. Levy. And I wrote an introduction to that book for uh, laissez-faire books when we reprinted a bunch of books um, a number of years ago. And uh, then I have, oh, look at here, Philosophers and Actresses, Part 1, by Arsena Husay, who is now an obscure French writer, but he was a kind of a big deal in his day. He was a cultural person. He wrote on theater and he wrote biographies. And Philosophers and Actresses is hilarious. But look at the last one I chose on my list of 250 to talk about. Here's My Monster Problem and Ours. I was the only person on library thing to have a copy of that book. That seems somehow wrong, doesn't it, Jim? That seems way wrong. As a matter of fact, that's on my list. So we can, we can share that. Yeah. And that... It was by somebody named James Gill. There you are. There it is right there. Do you have your middle name on that? Uh, yeah. Let's call it James Littleton Gill. Yeah, there you are. So we can distinguish Figure it from get all it, the other Gills. All the other Gills, yeah. And that was my second, actually, my second recent book. Here's the other one. Oh, what's Cognitive, it I Cognitive Bias Parade. Oh, okay. Number one. And you also, that's the one you did a lot of uh, work with. Isn't that the one you did a lot of work uh, in, in for the iBook version? The Oh, yeah. yeah. Or did this, you do it on both a, books? 
No, I did a an iBook version of this one. My monster problem in ours. Okay. Uh, that's interactive. So you got to. Uh, I like the idea of doing interactive collage collage work. So that's in process. I've got a sort of a sandbox set up with some of the pages that people can go to online. I'll give it to you so you can put it on the screen here. Very if good. anybody wants to go see it. And so this is, of course, is an art book. Yeah, these are um, sort of, um, I would call them cartoon, collage, illustration, something like that. Uh, you read it, I think you'd read it like you'd read a book of cartoons or a book of gag cartoons. But basically, it's stuff that I put together working with uh, the British Library online and the, and the um, Creative Commons and so forth. So everything is used in public domain or Creative Commons. And um, it's just this enormous wealth of stuff that you can um, that you can find and play with and put together. This strikes me as something everybody should be doing. It's impossible to do it and not not have great ideas just come pouring out. So get this for a little um, inspiration for something really fun to do. It would also be a good gift. You know, if somebody were to give me a, a gift of a book, I mean, how would they do that? I might already have it. I have about 5,000 books, 6,000 books. So how would they give me a gift of a book? Well, this is the kind of book that you can give even one of the Biblio Biblii because they probably don't have it. Yeah, sure, sure. There you are. Now, you also have uh, some friends who work uh, oh, yeah. in the cartoon industry, right? My good friend Paul Toomey has released this book. Screwball. It's a book about screwball comics. And uh, Art Spiegelman did a nice big review of it for the uh, New York Review of Books. And uh, It's a big, beautiful book. Oh, it's an absolutely gorgeous book. And basically, Paul dug into the the life stories and the histories of these of these crucial figures at the beginning of a uh, beginning of the comic strip and uh, the writing is just uh, writing is just beautiful the, the depth of uh, research this the, the thing this reminds me the most of is that beautiful collection that smiths the smithsonian did that everybody who liked comic strips had back in the 80s and 90s and i know paul was always a just a, a big fan of that and i think he was inspired to a great degree but this this has taken it to another level i think this is just a beautiful beautiful book lots of fascinating stories that's what's cool about it is it's centered it's built around the actual biographies of the cartoonists he's talking about and there was just this amazing overlap of of uh, cinema and visual arts and comics and music that, so i mean the fly was it the Fleischer, the rubber hose animation, and the Warner Brothers? I mean, there's a lot of elements of the screwball in them, right? Sure. Most of that comes a little bit after this, but definitely they were all inspired, including the guys who put together Mad Magazine and and uh, all of the and then and, and subsequently um, the whole Saturday Night Live school, the, the National Lampoon School of Humor. It, it, this can all be traced back through through uh, the history of American humor. And this is something cool that just came in the mail today. It's called Trump. It has nothing to do with our president. Um, it was So it's Trump-free Trump. Trump-free Trump, exactly. And I've been wanting to see this for years. It is uh, the Carby Kurtzman invented uh, or, or created Mad Magazine. And when he left, um, Hugh Hefner of Playboy uh, offered him oodles of money to produce this just high, high-quality uh uh, humor magazine, satire magazine, and uh, it was a resounding flop. I think about three issues came out. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's just incredibly sophisticated art and satire. And uh, who put it together? I'm sure it was Harvey, Harvey Kurtzman, Harvey Kurtzman, and Bill Elder, who after this went on to try another, another uh, more projects, but they finally settled in on working for Hugh Hefner again doing a comic strip called Little Annie Fanny. So the the creator of Mad Magazine, uh, the two uh, central creators, uh, Kurtzman and, and uh, Elder, uh, did Trump, and then they did Little Annie Fanny, which was a real, which was a sex-oriented comic strip. Or it wasn't really erotica, it was more, but it, it... It was body, wasn't it? 
In body, exactly. And then that this that Playboy published, as far as I can tell, was not an erotic. Uh, it had nothing to do with the like the sexy comics or cartoons that Playboy always ran. This is more like a, this was a grown up mad magazine. But like I say, it was so sophisticated, it never really grabbed an audience. And a few years later, National Lampoon grabbed the audience, I think, that he was aiming for, which was the adult market introduced, interested in humor. This was for an audience that didn't exist, except for some of us. If you, if you really loved the, like the 19th century uh, great European cartoonist, um, this was very much in that mode. You mean like Gill? <laughs> yeah, Gil was one of them. He works for Punch, I think. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm also thing? thinking of the Simplex Sissimus, the German, the German cartoon uh, magazine. This is on that level. This is this is this is for adults, and I don't mean pornography. I mean this is for grown-ups. This is stuff that that's really really uh, elegantly done. And and uh, so the book is called Trump. Is there a subtitle? The Ground Baking Magazine by the creator of Mad. Featuring Harvey Kurtzman, Will Elder, Jack, Al Jaffe, Jack Davis, Mel Brooks, Arnold Roth, Russ Heath, and Wally Wood, and with an essay by Dennis Kitchen. Um, I just saw a lot of people connected with Mad, as you can see. So this is a recent book? I think this came out a few years ago. I just finally saw a copy of it on Amazon that was affordable, so I grabbed it. Is, is it uh, was it used? Yeah, but right. it's perfect condition. You can find great condition, and it, it's a it's a hard cover with a slip cover, a dust cover. No, I didn't get a dust cover with it. Okay, okay. The title of uh, of Paul Toomey's book. This is Paul Toomey, T U M E Y. We have to also say all this stuff for our mm -hmm. audience on the radio. That's called Screwball. Is there a, a screwball, screwball with an exclamation point? Uh -huh. uh, what's the the subtitle? It is the cartoonist who made the funnies funny published by idw press and i think if you go to bud plant you can get this and a bonus that comes with it was a bunch of pages that he couldn't get into the book so he just printed it up as a bonus and told bud plant uh, that he could use it to help him sell the book so who is bud i think plant? bud plant runs a um, real famous uh, uh book book uh, sales um is it a distributor Business. or is yeah, it? He's a, he's, yeah, I guess you'd say he's a distributor. That's, that's right. He's a distributor. But lots of beautiful art books and cartoons and comics collections. Go to his site. I believe he's still doing it. Um, go to his site and take a look. You won't regret it. Okay. We hastily went over your books. You're James Littleton Gill, but you have mm -hmm. two books and they can be found. They, these are on Amazon. Just go to Amazon and look up My Monster Problem and Ours. And... Uh, and uh, Cognitive Bias Parade. Very good. On this one, I only called it is why James Gill. Okay. And this is James Littleton Gill. Okay. To keep things confusing right up front. Right of course, of course, we have to do that. Um, uh, it's, it's part of names. Um, or as Stefan Kinsella likes to say, NIMS. Stefan's, uh, Stefan's favorite uh, pejorative is to call somebody a NIM if they start playing around with their name. Anyway... Your book, uh, My Monster Problem and Ours, should be mentioned because it references a very famous essay that I don't know how many people, well, it's maybe not famous anymore, but it was in the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And that was Norman Podaritz. Uh, he wrote an essay called My Negro Problem and Ours? Yes. Yeah. The very title. Okay. Which always struck me as an interesting title. Have you ever read the essay? No, I've just, I've read descriptions of it. It's kind of hard to find. And Nathan told me that it's a great essay. He really liked it. Wikipedia says that the general gist of it was, um, I think he was, was he a liberal or conservative? He's a conservative. Was Pudritz, Pudritz. Yeah. Well, so he was, he was making this very earnest, uh, earnest, uh, um, I don't know, cry, complaint that he wasn't sure what to do about his Negro problem, you know, the classic American problem. But he was distinguishing between the social problem that we all recognize and we're all very, usually very pious about, as we have every reason to try to be, uh, and then the problem that most of the blacks he knew persecuted him and were in danger. 
Uh-huh. So that was a problem for him. And well, we've it, had friends. We've had friends who had similar experiences. Yes. One of our good friends from Seattle has just all these horrible stories yeah. <laughs> of black kids beating up on him. On the other hand, I went to a black high school in the South, and I never encountered anything like that. If anything, uh, there was a cordiality among the, the races that I haven't seen in the North. Um, but the boys, the black, I, I was in the, my, when I was in first grade, very first grade, I was, I was in the, the grade when they first started integrating. So I, the little black kids were just coming into my elementary school the year I started first grade. And Troy, Troy Rowland was one of my best friends that first year. He came to my birthday party, a little black boy and every, and of course, all of the white adults were extremely amused. This was the South. This was all very new, but maybe not. I did little white boys and little black boys in the South have been playing together forever. But anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I doubt if in this, this episode of the Local Focus Netcast that we're going to solve the race problems in America. I, no, I, I just no. really doubt that we're going to do it. No. Um, in fact, I'm going I'm to go pretty strong for the book problem in America, which Americans don't read enough books. Though surely, now that we've gone to uh, uh, have this coronavirus nonsense, uh, excuse me, the, the coronavirus pandemic and the lock, lockdown orders, that people have been reading more books along with eating more at home. Uh, I'm assuming people have read more in the last six months than they have previously. Uh, maybe a lot of web searching, a web browsing, um, but books, I don't know. I don't see many people talking about books. I read a lot of books online now just so I can have the font size a little bit bigger, and I've gotten used to it. But cartoons and comics are a little harder to read online. Yeah. Now, I so have... Anyway, I was going to say about Poderitz, um, about the... Wikipedia claims that his final final conclusion was the problems weren't going to be solved until the races just disappeared, until we converged. Um, and maybe, I mean, maybe that is the solution that has to happen. But anyway, I found it intriguing because the idea of merging or overlapping or com- combining things definitely um, – um, overlaps with what I'm trying to do with the book, which is collage and cartoons and humor and and playing around with philosophical ideas. So that's some background on that. So our readers should just go on Amazon and pick up My Monster Problem and Ours. Just for fun, they're probably not going to pick up the a book I just got in the mail very recently, which is The Odyssey of Homer, uh, first volume by William Cullen Bryant. Now, you, now people may wonder why do I why do I even make the deal of this? Well, one reason to talk about it is that William Cullen Bryant was local was, foco. He was a local foco, and this is uh, a translation of Homer by a local foco writer. That's, pretty cool. That has to be that has to be worth something, and so, so I bought it. And actually, it's pretty good. And this is I, I may actually make a go of reading that book. Now, another book that I got in the mail a while back, actually. It, I uh, like I say I, I tend to read a number of books at simultaneously, and this is one that I started. Not the world of Nolle, which I, you can see here. That's A.E. A. E. Van Vogt. I read the world of Nolle like twenty years ago, but flip it over, and it's the Universe Maker. And there's A.E. Van Vogt's other novel. And actually, I started reading this like two weeks ago, and I was surprised at how good it was. Because how good it was was not what I was thinking when I've read. Van Vogt in previous times. There's always been a problem with the Van Vogt story. This I thought was doing pretty well, and uh, and then I lost it for a half a week or a week, so I couldn't find it, and it was in a coat pocket. So that was unfortunate. Um, now another book I got recently. I'm into a, into a history, ancient history, and here is Manetho, and Manetho. This is his work, which is uh, which is in the Loeb Library. So if, if I read Greek, this actually might be a good idea. And if you wanted to learn Greek is to read an actual ancient source. Uh, we get most of this, I believe, from how Josephus cribbed it. Uh, Josephus quoted Manetho at length. I don't believe we have a manuscript or anything like that available of Manetho. I believe it's largely from other authors, including Josephus. Does this have some... Uh connection to Jesus? Is this that Josephus? Yes and no. He didn't write about Jesus. Uh, He was a Jewish author. He was actually a Jewish revolutionary who, a very famous guy. I have a a biography that I just got in the mail like about 
a month ago, and it's very interesting. He's a, quite a character, but he wrote The Antiquities of the Jews, which gives us a lot of very interesting history on uh, the Jews, the ancient Jews. And there, he has his own version of the Bible in it, by the way. And uh, also, I find them interesting because there is a famous or two famous passages that have been interpolated into his text by Christian monks, probably, scribes of some sort, uh, on Jesus. And it's so patently not in his style and not anything he would say that it's obviously forgery. However, after one of them, like about three paragraphs later or three pages later, he talks about a very similar character in Samaria, which is just north of Jerusalem, who Pontius Pilate hounded and uh, probably killed. And then the Samaritans were so annoyed with Pontius Pilate, that Pontius Pilate was sent back to Rome because of how he routed and killed a religious procession, basically. But Pontius Pilate was not pleased with the direction that this religious procession or pilgrimage was going. So he routed them all, and, and many of them fled, and he killed as many as he could. Here's another book that came in the mail fairly recently. The Fourth Revolution, The Global Race to Reinvent the State. Now, Joe Scarborough likes it, which is not a good sign. <laughs> but uh, but I am curious about what a mainstream person would think about what's going on in the modern state. Here's another book I got in the mail recently, and which I started reading, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's about Genghis Khan and the quest for God. And look at the t subtitle on this. How the world's greatest conqueror gave us religious freedom. Well, that's a big promise. Yeah, and it's a really interesting treatise on the subject. It turns out Thomas Jefferson was very, very much enamored style of uh, of conquering somebody but then letting them keep their their culture right well but the roman style was to incorporate them into their pantheon only mm -hmm. the, only the jews were allowed their own god and not forced to worship the emperor because they had a very old religion so that's why the christians got persecuted so much by the roman empire the early their religion was too new the religion was new and they wouldn't worship the emperor and it was a very political religion the interesting thing about genghis khan is that he didn't inflict any religion on anyone. He basically established religious freedom wherever he went. Now, of course, he killed millions and millions of people. And he or his uh, troop raped tens of thousands of women. And so he has so his genetics are all over the world. Uh, and he had the biggest empire, I think, in world history. He called himself the scourge of God. And oh, this is, this is an amazing book. I, I mean, really, I think people should read this book. So was this an active uh, atheist atheist agenda, or, or what was the back, what was the reasoning behind how how he behaved? I have not finished the book, so I can't really tell you yet, and I don't know if we can even know for certain why he did what he did. Well, I would guess it's my guess is this just to keep people pass his his conquest pacified, right? And don't stir him up too much, right? It, it, what he saw in the world he came into and started conquering was a world in which there was religious discord everywhere. Everybody was having, there was a, it was a great violent time. I mean, the Christians were, and the Muslims were at each other's throat. And the Buddhists, the Hindu, I mean, it was just everywhere. It was just not very has nice. That, has that ever not been the case? Oh, when sure. It? It, you know, there have been times when this has not been the case so much. I mean, this was a time when he came on the scene, it was a time of great religious discord, probably more than usual. Uh, probably much more than now, I would say, certainly, because we have religious freedom now. And he basically... Um, if I remember this correctly, it's been about a month since I've read any of this book, but if I remember, he basically would send emissaries or he would talk to the religious leaders of a, a people that he was about to conquer. And he would say, well, submit or die is basically his point. And when they complained, he would say, if God were on your side, I wouldn't be here. He did this to everyone. He used religion as a form of psychological warfare. I'm not saying he's a good man. I can't can't believe that anyone like him would be a good man. But he did inspire Thomas Jefferson, who gave multiple copies of a uh, biography of uh, Temujin, of Genghis Khan, to his friends. I believe he gave a copy to George Washington, if I'm, I'm not incorrect. Of course, J Thomas Jefferson did that to a lot of people. But probably one of the reasons he was in debt is that he did that way too much. Uh, he also famously uh, translated Volney and the Tout de Tracy, so... There's another Thomas Jefferson connection. Oh, circulating memes was a little more expensive in the old days. Yeah, it was. Uh, he actually had to go out and translate books himself to get his what he wanted out there. But that was, once again, Genghis Khan and the Quest for God by Jack Weatherford. 
How the World's Greatest Conqueror Gave Us Religious Freedom. Very interesting book. Now, I should switch to the next book. I got it just in the mail yesterday. No one else had this on the library thing. It's The Experience of Nothingness by Michael Novak. Many of us have heard of Michael Novak. He was a famous conservative writer with strong, well, somewhat both libertarian and I think neoconservative tendencies. So he was he's somebody we've known about. But this is a book about nothingness. It's a slender book, so I guess that there is a limit to what you can say about nothingness. Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a book on nothingness, and it was not slender. I also got Husserl and the Search for Certitude by Lezek Kolakowski. And uh, Kolakowski was a famous uh, turncoat from the leftist faith. He became an anti-leftist, an anti-communist anyway, a very famous gentleman indeed. And this is a book on Husserl, who was one of the more interesting philosophers of the 20th century. Now, as as, um, a person who's seeing this on video, might be able to see in my background. Can you see it there? It's Meinong and and the Principle of Independence by Carol Lambert. You've been talking about Meinong for years and years. Right. One of the more important thinkers that I've ever read is Karl Menger, the economist. He was a Viennese economist who started the what we call the Austrian School of Economics. What's not talked about among our circles, the individualist, the libertarian, the locofoco circles very much, is how important uh, Austrian philosophy was. Viennese philosophy. There were two schools of Viennese philosophy, as far as I can understand. There was the positivists, and then there was the Brentano school, the Franz Brentano school. And uh, and that bequeathed us what we call continental philosophy, which is a very different kettle of fish from the Rudolf Carnap and that kind of positivism. Uh, and Ludwig von Mises was closer to the continental school. And so it's kind of interesting that the two main figures in Austrian philosophical value theory of axiology were were, um, Alexius Meinong and Ehrenfels. I forget Ehrenfels' first name. But I almost never hear any libertarian ever talk about these philosophers, Meinong and Ehrenfels. But they dealt with value quite a bit, and they had important things to say about value, and they were inspired and took off on from... Carl Menger's approach. Part of it's they started of subjectivism, but they were looking for objective value. So it's a very interesting treatment. I have no idea why libertarians would not talk about it more often because libertarians love talking about both the subjectivist school of value from the economists, and then many of them talk about Ayn Rand, who was an objectivist in value theory. And you would think that they would go back and look at the roots of the problem, at least go far as back to the Austrian school of philosophy with Alexius Meinong. Now, Meinong's most important contribution was his theory of objects, which is a theory of objects that does not deal with objects as things, but as objects of our intention, of our attention. And it turns out that not all the things that we attend to exist. There are two other categories of things that he talked about in a very interesting way, and I've been trying to track down and make sense of that for years. I mean, I'm still an amateur at this, and I don't really understand, but I think it's a very interesting problem because I think many people who get involved in philosophy, especially from a political bent, they want to prove things about the real world, and they jump the gun, and they use logic, and they use category theory, and a number of really tricky arguments to go from their generalizations to a very important conclusion about the world and maybe about what we should do. And my approach has always been a little bit different, is to try to really understand everything from top to bottom and not getting the categories confused. And if there are categories of thought that aren't, if there are real things that aren't existent, they don't exist, but they or some other kind of thing, you should really understand that well before you get too far in philosophy. And that's one of the reasons I'm interested in Meinong. But, you know, I have many interests, and we'll, we'll go back to my more, a more recent book that came in the, no, actually not a recent book, it's one that came in the mail some time back. It's, this is a man named Jean-Marie Guillot from 1854 to 1888. This is actually a, if you look at this on, on, on the video, you'll see that this is a reprint book 
I'm pretty sure this is a standard reprint book. This is this is the same image they use on a lot of reprints. So this is the first one I bought from this company. It's just a reprint of a book that I wasn't able to find cheaply online. And it's a sketch of morality independent of obligation or sanction. In politics, we're concerned mainly with obligation theory of what may be legally compelled and morally compelled. We're looking for the compulsory. But there is a kind of morality that is not about obligation and sanction. Lon Fuller referred to it as the morality of aspiration. Well, this guy has a different take on it, and he was heavily influenced by Herbert Spencer. I have another one of his books downstairs. You can see this is another book that came in the mail, a reprint, no, a rebinding of a 19th century book by Wordsworth Donisthorpe, one of the best names in, in uh, libertarian philosophy, an individualist, and it's called Law in a Free State. And he began, this is 1895, and what's interesting about this in part is his discussion of what the individualist movement was like in 1895, because he begins by talking about how few individualists there were when he was started being interested in libertarian ideas, what we now call libertarian ideas. And he noted that when he started out 20 years earlier or 30 years earlier, he said they could all fit in one room. All the individualists of England could fit in one room. Now, by individualist, do you mean in the in the libertarian sense, or do you have some other thing no, in mind? No, that is, that is the sense. We're talking about here is that they started using the word individualism to describe classical liberalism, what we call classical liberalism today, the liberalism of free minds and free markets, to use the now hackneyed phrase of Reason Magazine. And that kind of liberal, you couldn't talk about that very well anymore because the people who called themselves liberal were already, by the end of the 19th century, becoming more and more socialistic and technocratic, which has nothing to do with what these people were talking about. And they saw collectivism as a problem, and it was creeping into everything. And so they called themselves individualists and their doctrine of individualism. And that was by the end of the 19th century. J.H. Levy and Oberon Herbert, following Herbert Spencer's uh, lead, you might say, uh, mm -hmm. were developing their version and more coherent version of libertarianism, and they call it individualism at the time. It is worth mentioning that uh, in 1911, H.L. Mencken wrote a book. Uh, it's The Men Versus the Man or The Man Versus the Men. I can never remember the title. And he called himself an individualist in that. He didn't call himself a Republican, though he's basically just a Republican, a lowercase Republican, a limited government man. That's what he was. But he wasn't, you know, consistent in any way. He was. That's just what he was. He was a, he was a limited government man, and uh, and he called his doctrine individualism. But Donna Thorpe says that in 1895 there were thousands and thousands of individualists all over Britain. It was very popular. They had a number of major movements going on. And uh, that's a very interesting thing because that all died out and it was killed off by World War I. And I think we should all recognize that World War I destroyed a civilization in a sense. And one of the things it destroyed was the old kind of liberalism, individualism, individualism at the time. And so I'm very interested in these fellows the individualists, Aberon Herbert and J.H. Levy and Wordsworth Donisthorpe, in part because they were creating libertarianism in their day in Great Britain with a large popular following, and it really did help develop what we think of as libertarianism. In fact, they have the first modern formulations, I would say. The negative formulation you can find in some of their writings is the idea, no one has a right to uh, initiate force against others. That's almost how you, one of them says that at some point in one of their writings, and I need to dig it up again, but I have to read a lot of books to find it. Anyway, so I, these guys really interest me, and I've written about them. I've written an introduction to J.H. Levy's The Outcome of Individualism, and also introductions to uh, Eve Guillaume's two books that were translated into English that we republished at Laissez Faire Books about five, six, seven years ago. And uh, Guillaume was also called an individualist at the time. He was an anti-socialist. They were basically anti-socialists. But they were anti-socialists with principle, not anti-socialists because it wouldn't work. They were anti-socialists because not only wouldn't it work, it would work to do something that was really horrible. J.H. Uh, Levy basically predicted how awful for family life and for just a sense of self that destroying the family would entail by getting the government involved in the family. That's how he ended the outcome of individualism, is talking about basically about sex. And so right now we live in a very decadent society wherein sex is not about sex, it's about gender. And they imagine all sorts of categories that 
they just cook up out of the out, out of the ether, and uh, it's kind of interesting to see just how things have changed in a hundred years. So that's what how they, how new is is the idea of individualism? Is uh, what do you think about that? I, I, is is um, is thinking is thinking in, in an individualist way something something new, or is that is it something that 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 goes back as 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 far as recorded history. Well, that's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, Anthony Comagna asserted in a recent episode that it it's always been that's there. what that's what made me think of it. That's what I that's right. And I think that Comagna is right. It's always a possibility. I mean, the libertarian idea it's always near at hand. That's the interesting thing. It's, it's always near at hand. But human beings get caught up in hierarchies, and the hierarchies are sometimes very very important in times of conflict to really be loyal to your hierarchies, and hierarchies do not tend to countenance a more egalitarian base for political allegiance and sovereignty. And so, I mean, Herbert Spencer talked about how in the civilizational level, the level above tribes and, and you know, from chieftains on up, the tendency for everything to be arranged militarily, the militant type of organization. And that's pretty stratified, but, you know, the Tao Te Ching has some very libertarian uh, statements in it. Uh, the Book of Samuel has some very libertarian statements in it. Oh, that's right. You wrote a Quora response on this topic, didn't you? Of of uh, of early, uh, maybe even uh, uh, ancient uh, examples of libertarianism. Do you remember what the question is? Where people can find it? I'll put it up on screen and I'll mention it in the uh, in the uh, show notes, as they say, and I'll probably even mention it at the end of this podcast when I do my wrap up. What's the earliest example we have of of um, the idea of the individual not being subordinate to the state or to the group? I don't think that's often talked about. Uh, it's sort of implied in a lot of talk, though. You know, the real the real thing that really distinguishes libertarianism from other forms of individualism, you might say, is this daringness of being able to apply the same standard to all individuals up and down any hierarchy or in any in-group or out-group. So we have a, it's just a very interesting idea, is that we apply this one principle pretty consistently everywhere. And that's very libertarian. And that is this idea of equal rights under the law is very old, and many ancient ideas come from it. And I mean, I, I mentioned to Anthony that I considered that some of the uh, statements that you get from Quetzalcoatl and, and the Viracochas in the South America and in Mesoamerica, uh, they sound very libertarian to me. Many times they do. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of tribes everywhere that behave in a very libertarian manner. Uh, Herbert Spencer, in his Principles of Sociology and his Principles of Ethics, talks about how some tribes were so far at more peaceful and free than Britain of his time, which he considered heavily militant. There was a problem with uh, uh, sailors, uh, I mean not sailors, with uh, with settlers uh, abandoning civilization to go live with the, the natives, right? There certainly was. Yeah, was it called going native, I believe? I believe that's yeah, what it yeah. was. Yeah. And in a sense, that's kind of commemorated by uh, a uh, quasi-locofocal writer that Anthony and I did not talk about, James Fenimore Cooper. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, is he a quasi libertarian? Well, he wrote a book called The American Democrat, which reads to me like a locofoco document. But Anthony and I did not talk about it, so and I've not read it all the way through. I have to look into it. I don't really know much about Anthony uh, about James Fenimore Cooper. I've never read one of his novels. I bought one fairly recently just simply because I got curious. But uh, he's no notorious, you know, Mark Twain, who was a bourbon Democrat and kind of on our side in some way, uh, made a very famous case against James Fenimore Cooper about how many awful things, uh, how awful James Fenimore Cooper was. Right? The literary crimes of James Fenimore Cooper. There you are. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and it's a pretty fun piece. But D.H. Lawrence uh, wrote a defense of Cooper. So that's interesting. I think Lawrence, as a kid, really liked James Fenimore Cooper. And that may have led to James, 
to D.H. Lawrence's, he may have been an inspiration for Lawrence's own very bizarre and eccentric and maybe quasi-individualist take on life and sex and romance and everything else. Uh, Lawrence was kind of character. One of my favorite novels, you know, if I can keep my memory from when the time when I was 19 or 18 when I read it, is Point Counterpoint by Aldous Huxley. And there is a D.H. Lawrence character in that book. And it is a magnificent book. I love the book. Uh, it's very brilliantly cynical and funny. But well, Lawrence uh, has that beautiful quote, isn't it, Lawrence? The, yes. the quote, yeah, about that. That, that there's, there's, what, what is it? Men, men become free. Well, damn it, you're going to have to look it up and put. I it. will put it up on screen, and even recite it here for my listeners, people who are only podcast users. Here it is. Men fight for liberty and win it with hard knocks. Their children, brought up easy, let it slip away again, poor fools. And their grandchildren are once more slaves. You'll find libertarian ideas everywhere, right? It's not really a radical idea so much as a opportunity that people keep on giving up. And one of the reasons they give up is because they have to give up something else they want. And what they want is to live at the expense of others or to gain an advantage using the state. The state is this amazing organization that people really are oriented towards. And I find it very interesting. And I'm not sure we can ever get rid of the state. Uh, I'd like to, but I don't know if we can. So we have to really understand why is it people love the state and want to use the state. But the main reason people want to use the state was given by Aldous Huxley in his uh, preface to Erewhon, uh, which I will also put on screen uh, and quote. I'll insert it into this uh, discussion uh, because it's a great quote about what is it that uh, human beings really get out of politics and big causes. Well, one of the things they get is they get an excuse to be nasty towards other people and feel self-righteous at the same time, to be able to be, to hurt other people and to feel entirely justified. This is a heady mix, as uh, Aldous Huxley puts it. And I think this is the source of much of the love of the state by people. They think themselves quite righteous and they defend it to the death. It's just like a person who, you know, I occasionally deal with women who have had abortions and they're very, very strong pro-abortion people. Well, why wouldn't they be? Because otherwise, if you're against abortion, you think it's murder and they don't want to be thought of as murderers. And nearly everybody has something in the state that's on the same order. Everybody's in on the act because they get some special advantage of it. They don't want to give up their social security checks. Well, they've been paying into all these years, right? Well, there's all these traps. And so we get caught up in the state, but there's so much exploitation necessarily involved in the state that it, to be able to transcend it would be a great idea. So before I go further, I must do an insert, an insert for a promised quotation. Here's from Aldous Huxley. Men show at least as much zeal in mischief as in well-doing, in folly as in wisdom. The surest way to work up a crusade in favor of some good cause is to promise people that they will have a good chance of maltreating someone. Men must be bribed to build up and do good by the offer of an opportunity to hurt and pull down, to be able to destroy with good conscience, to be able to behave badly, and to call your bad behavior righteous indignation. This is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. In any cause, the best or the most atrocious, zeal is always intoxicating. A world without zeal would be a world deprived of many simple but savage pleasures. But at least half its present excuses for interfering and bullying would have been taken away from it. That's Aldous Huxley from the introduction to the Easton Press edition of Samuel Butler's Erewhon, 1934, signed July 24th, 1933. And full disclosure, I wrote a foreword to Erewhon, but not in 1933 or 1934, but a few years ago for the Laissez-Faire Book Club. It's available still on the Apple iBooks platform. And in that spirit, I should look at the last of the books that I, my recent acquisitions. Now, this is not a book that I only have. Other people have this book. Like, of those books, only one or two of those books are ones that only I had. But this is The Limits of Liberty by James Buchanan, James M. Buchanan, the great economist. And is this book mentioned specifically in the in the in the uh, assault on him that what's your name wrote? I don't know. I couldn't bear to read that 
book of uh, Nancy McLeod. Was that her name? Nancy McLean? McLean, I think. Uh, yeah, I couldn't read that book. That's that's. It's obviously so nuts uh, and it's so easily disproven, and it was easily disproven, that it's just hard to countenance that at all. The fact that it's popular and that it's gained credence. I mean, on the left, they really want to malign the idea of freedom and tar it with racism. That's the thing they must do above all things, because if people actually looked at the nature of the things and the principles we are advancing, freedom is the egalitarian ideal, not anti-racism. Well, Paul Jacob, in one of his uh, essays, pointed out that, um, how did it go? It was that socialists emphasize um, racism when they're talking about slavery, because they know that if they focused on freedom, it would scuttle their socialism. And that struck me as a, a good observation. Yes, and we need to recognize a really obvious point is that the Soviets plotted to emphasize racism in their propaganda in America to undermine America. That was the that was their explicit program. Oh yeah. And oh, the yeah. left has basically taken the Soviet propagandistic psyop warfare and have made it their own in America. And I think that they should be deeply ashamed of that. I think that they should look at their obsession with racism and see it for what it is, as they've gone overboard. Because, of course, they are now racist. That's the problem. If you don't have other principles and you're anti-racist, you end up being a racist of a different kind. And now they're, you know, they're really advocating quite clearly anti-white racism. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's just hard to understand how anyone in their right mind could could go for it for more than one moment. And it's not as if there isn't a lot on the line here. And I guess that's where I should stop today because I'm almost through reading an amazing book, a book that I really recommend to nearly everyone. And it's right here. It's by Bartolome de las Casas. It's a short account of the destruction of the Indies. He was a part of that destruction, wasn't he? Was it, wasn't well, he, a he was a priest and he was assigned to the New World, and he witnessed the Spaniards just killing people en masse. Just, just a, a bloodbath you couldn't believe. It's just so amazingly cruel and thorough. It was a kind of genocide that did go on. And Now, you, you, your position is that was not entirely uh, um, condemnable uh, in some cases, since some of the tribes that he... That, it, that that were attacked were, were pretty bloodthirsty. Well, I only say that the Aztec Empire coming down could hardly be a great tragedy for mankind. It was a bloody and horrid empire. And so but it's this like, is, he's talking about more than that, I take he's it. He's talking about all the peaceful people from around the Caribbean mainly. And, and But he goes everywhere, and he says that they all, these people never did anything to the Spaniards. They really It wasn't quelling rebellions that they were doing. They were never exacting revenge. The Spaniards were just bloody, thirsty murderers. Well, and, were they, they but were he said thieves, it wasn't— right? They wanted the gold. They wanted that's gold it. And, did they want slaves? Did they try to they tried. They, they tried it. But De La Casas makes it very clear— he didn't really look at it as a problem of in-group, out-group. He looked at it as an amazing degree of greed, a degree of greed that you could not believe. And he explains why some of it happened, because the Spaniards actually emptied some of their jails and sent them to the New World. So we need to be very clear about the importance of a rule of law and the idea of freedom and giving other people their rights. And it's not just about race, because greed can be the sin that leads you to do evil things as well. It's not just racism. And, you know, some of the things we think of as racism in America, sometimes it was greed, too. You know, almost any of the classic sins or the vices can be the source of many crimes. But it's not just the vice that we have to deal with in each case. We have to deal with the nature of the criminality itself and oppose it for being criminal. As bad as racism was and is, it's ineradicable because it's based on certain category errors. Human beings will always be racist to some degree. And if the aliens come, wh whoever they are, if you want to see racism, that's going to be racism. Uh, and it might even be justified, we might say. We may be ephemerons. What if they live for thousands of years? Uh, these future travelers or travelers now, whoever they are, I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them, because I don't know if they exist. But... 
Ronald Reagan kept on mentioning him in, spe- in speeches, so I'm going to mention it too. We'd all come together if it was an alien race attacking us, he basically Oh, yeah, said. sure, sure. Well, you know, even if they don't attack us, or if they've been attacking us individually for thousands of years, or if they've been messing with us, which seems likely, and Carl Sagan suggested as much in his early work on uh, where would you find uh, alien contact with humanity? You'd find it in the past. That's the better place to look. It's better than looking at the stars because it's just to be a hard way of finding aliens, uh, of extraterrestrial civilizations. Sagan. So Sagan was interested in the ancient astronaut stuff early on, right? Before Eric von Deniken had a... Gleaming that's kind of played that, that's played down uh it is certainly played down and i think that people need to recognize it more it's one of the reasons that uh that's a future book coming into my uh, into my library i'm pretty sure uh though i am reading a book uh, online uh it'll t- it's taken me forever because i read a chapter here a chapter there about carl sagan's uh interest in the ancient alien does he disavow all that later or just stop talking about it the author of the book I'm reading says that NASA brought their full weight to get Sagan to shut up. That they did something to Sagan. They offered him lots of prospects for research. Uh, We don't know what they did to Sagan exactly because that was never clear. Uh, But uh, yeah. Is anybody speculating the possibility that the globalist will use a fake alien attack to to, uh fulfill Reagan's uh, um, uh, observation about aliens bringing the world together? This is the great fear in the ufology community. Yes, it's talked about all the time. They believe that one of the reasons some people are talking, I mean, some believe that one of the reasons for ATIP and the To the Stars Academy uh, disclosure, the slow disclosure going on right now about UFOs, the reason they're doing it this way is maybe because they're plotting to fake an alien attack with technology they themselves have been working on in the background. I mean, there's elaborate conspiracy theories. You know, if you were going to do it, it, that's pretty much the, that's what you would do, right? I mean, if I were, if I were given the task of bringing about a global, global government, that would be at the top of my list of things to try. Wouldn't it? You're Sue? Yes. Create a common enemy? Of course. Yes. Yes. Well, all right, let's stop this. Jim and I went on for well over an hour, and we wandered into a lots of uh, UFO and alien invasion kind of stuff, so obviously things are getting out of hand, because I don't know anything about that stuff. Though I do have a theory about the epistemic element to these kind of discussions, which I think most people get quite wrong. There's a great deal of pride that uh, intellectuals have in scorning UFO discussions, They're actually not being good scientists. They're not being smart. They're not being wise. They're being kind of proud idiots. But let's put that aside. I'm trying to be very humble in this episode, and I shouldn't be calling other people proud idiots, right? That's not a good idea. Who really should be calling anyone proud idiots, right? Probably proud idiots. So here I am. In early July, with my coronavirus haircut, or lack thereof, and I'm trying to wrap up an episode where we talked about books. Obviously, I have a lot of books to read. Probably just as obvious, I've read quite a lot of books. I made this episode because I think uh, people need to talk about books more. I'm getting a little bit tired of everybody talking about Trump. And everybody talking about um, things they know nothing about. Obviously because of the horrible interpretive capabilities of most people in politics not being able to understand their enemies at all. Their opponents are just almost opaque to them. So maybe people should read some more books. Read a few novels. Read a novel outside of your normal preference range. You know, readers should read more than one genre. I like a number of genres of fiction, from the highest literature to the lowly realms of science fiction and mystery. And uh, that helps you think. I hope. I think it helps you think. What do you think? Well, at localfoco.us, you can give us your opinions. That's where we meet uh, to talk and share memes, as they say these days. 
You can find this podcast at locofoco.net and on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcatchers and other podcatchers. So how do I wrap this up? I'm not sure. I had no grand scheme for making this podcast. I thought we'd talk about some books that I'm interested in. I really want to go back to finish up reading De Las Casas and A.E. Van Vogt. Now there's a pair for you. So turn the podcast machine off now. Turn off your iPad. Turn off your computer. Turn off your Android device and read a book. Or turn on your computer. Turn on your iPad. Turn on your Android device and read a book. I don't care how you do it. They say it makes more sense to do digital books, but uh, my 5,000-plus volume library is going to come in handy after the EMP hits, eh? Thanks for listening. My name is Timothy Vericolo. You can find me at, at Workman and Workman.com. Contact me on Gab. I'm at Workman. That's Workman with an I, and I don't know.